All right. Thank you, members of Bragg. Uh, I want to thank you again for having me down. I, I apologize about the very last minute switch in topic. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you who have worked in compliance archaeology, government archaeology, anything dealing with Section 106 know that um, sometimes we get to work on really great projects, but um, we're just one component of the whole process. And I had gotten in touch with some various people. I thought it might be a good idea to touch base and see where things were at with this project, which had happened in 2017. And um, things outside of anybody's control are happening. And it was just sort of best if I uh, keep my mouth shut about it for a few more years. Um, so uh, I apologize about the, the, the sudden change here at the end. But uh, um, I'm, I'll be talking today about my uh, dissertation uh, in for, uh, propo uh, what I'm doing for my PhD. Uh, and Bill very kindly uh, said it was interesting. I, I hope I can present it in a way that uh, is very broadly interesting. I want to situate it in its larger context, which is Britain, uh, all of Britain, Wales, England, Scotland. Uh, at the very end of the Iron Age, transitioning into the Roman period, um, the things I look at are um, ritualized feasting and what that means for social structures and how that interacts with colonialism and what uh, what colonialism is theoretically you know other than one place colonizing another place what does that what does that mean and how can we measure those interactions archaeologically uh, also from uh, Bill's like an excellent introduction uh, I, I am I always like to think of myself as a as a field guy I'm a little red in the face today because I've been walking through cornfields since 8 a.m uh, but my my research has sort of taken me out of the field where I, I, I feel like I do um, where I'm very comfortable and, and puts me in a laboratory doing very close analysis of artifacts, um, which I thought might be something that we, we don't always get uh, for break speak, uh, speakers. And I, I, I thought it might be interesting to talk you through um, what happens when we encounter problems uh, with laboratory methodologies um, and, and what do we do to fix them? Because the, the sort of arc of my talk will be how I started my research uh, how it went terribly wrong, uh, and where I'm at now. Um, so with that, we can get underway. Uh, very broadly speaking, uh, Roman Britain refers to the time period uh, from 43 AD through the 5th century, wherein the island parts of the island of Britain uh, were brought in as a uh, first a territory and a province of the Roman Empire. Uh, Julius Caesar had been uh, had made an excursion into Britain in 50 BC. He played around for a bit, met the locals, uh, and then made a hasty retreat. Uh, it was not until the reign of Emperor Claudius in 43 that a full-scale invasion of the island was commenced with the intent of bringing the territory into Roman control. Uh, so we, we sort of break, we can break the Roman period down into an early, middle, and late phase. That early phase is the successive series of conquests that were focused on expanding Roman control, um, subduing or, or, or dealing with local peoples in a way to incorporate them into a province as they had through mainland Europe, uh, through Gaul, through Iberia. Um, and then they, they sort of reached their greatest extent into Scotland um, and then they begin to move backwards and we reach the sort of middle Roman period in Britain, which is really defined by a series of uh, territorial shoring up. This is where the very famous Hadrian's Wall comes from. Uh, it's built uh, right in the middle of this middle period as a way of what, what was thought for a long time, and we'll talk about this, to be a, a creating a hard line uh, at the end of the Roman Empire. This was then expanded briefly uh, under the reign of Antonius Pius for the Antonine Wall. We'll show a picture of that at one point. Um, but this is the intervallum period, the literally between walls period. Uh, and it's, it's really uh, in a, a time where we've got a lot of activity happening in Northern Britain and Southern Scotland today called the Borders region. And it's uh, despite how much structural archaeology we have, 
it's probably the most contentious period in terms of what is actually happening. Uh, and this is where theory about what could be happening comes into play. And we'll, we will get to that. And then finally, we get into the late period, which covers the stretch into the fifth century where Britain moves further from the empire. Uh, at times, the empire recedes and sort of leaves the island to its own. And eventually, you, you stop, it stops being Roman Britain and you transition into that um, early medieval Britain, um, late antiquity, uh, which is interesting, but far outside the scope of, of things I know. Um, for no good reason, moving in reverse chronological order, the, the late Iron Age, the place and time that the Romans find Britain uh, is coming at the long, uh, the end of a long period of, um, as, as stable as prehistory goes, the, the Iron Age had been uh, fairly homogeneous in its in the archaeological record. Um, in when we do get burials, we know what they look like. We've identified a few individual cultures that exist throughout the Iron Age. We know that for the most of the Iron Age, people are concentrating into hill forts. These are um, sort of ringed, uh, structured sort of proto cities that exist on top of hills uh, across the landscape. Uh, so there's really this sort of concentration of power, this moving towards urban, the, the beginning of urban spaces in the landscape, um, and uh, so, some fairly consistent material culture to go along with all of that. And then we hit the late Iron Age, um, just in the last 150 years before the Romans arrived. And things seem to be changing very rapidly. We know the climate is changing. Uh, we know that the... Uh, the hill forts are either changing in, in scope or purpose or people are leaving and we get a, a new proliferation of new types of material culture. Uh, and one of the more interesting areas where we get new material culture uh, is through feasting. Uh, we, we know that feasting was a phenomenon throughout all of prehistoric Europe. Uh, and in particular, it seems to have been exercised on a fairly large scale in Britain. We know this uh, from the fact that we find large faunal assemblages that all were created at the same time. That means, you know, you had a big barbecue, you end up with a lot of bones and fat and other detritus from what you didn't eat and you throw it in the ground all at the same time. We find those assemblages uh, around these uh, inhabited areas quite often, indicating that people are, um, they have day-to-day -day food consumption patterns, but there's, they're, every once in a while, they're doing something very different where they're consuming a lot of food and they're consuming very special foods. Uh, we also know this from changing agricultural storage practices. Uh, the need to store a lot of food seems to increase around this time. And uh, we also know that there, there's an increase in the interest in, of imported goods, in particular wine from the Mediterranean. Um, wine had been moving for the last 300 years through most of mainland Europe, and they really didn't seem particularly interested until the late Iron Age. They get a, either they get a taste for wine or because something is changing within feasting, they become particularly interested in importing that wine. Uh, a couple of <laughs> grainy photos by the author. Uh, we have an example. Uh, here's a really interesting um, feasting equipment. Uh, it's called a fire dog. Uh, they are sort of decorated roasting spits uh, that could you know, accommodate really large uh, pieces of meat. This is pretty heavy duty uh, solid iron. So you could really hook most of a cow on here if you wanted to. Um, here's an, uh, a reconstruction of somebody who was buried with some of their favorite feasting goods. Here's a lot of imported amphora from the Mediterranean, storage goods with mead, with grains, with meats, uh, and a couple of uh, copper alloy uh, frying pans down at the bottom for good measure. Um, but by far the most interesting, or at least the most sort of visually spectacular uh, element to uh, feasting equipment were the cauldrons. Uh, they were, well, we can't, we can't say for, for certain that they are the, the centerpiece of, of a feast, 
but we know from the way that they are often arranged in votive deposits we find in swampy or liminal areas um, with things arranged around or in a cauldron, we know that they had some kind of special uh, importance. Um, we know that from the way that we find them, we know that uh, just from a sort of labor perspective, that they were, of all the feasting equipment we have, of all of the pr proliferation of new material culture, they are the sort of the most, uh, they require the most technical skill to make. Um, and we also capture, uh, later on, and I'll, I'll show in a slide, uh, we capture through early medieval literature some sort of possibly surviving folklore about the, the ritual potency of cauldrons. Uh, so here we have actually a reconstructed cauldron from the time period. Um, that a, a, a very talented um, smith made uh, for a local community where uh, of cauldrons were found, but they were carted off to the British Museum, knowing that they weren't going to get any of them back. The smith sort of volunteered his time and materials and made a, a really, really lovely and really accurate reconstruction. And, and here we have our weird sisters from Macbeth toiling uh, over their bubbling cauldron. Uh, but here's some examples of what the things actually look like. Um, a couple of things to note. Uh, they are almost always uh, made out of a copper alloy. Um, they would have been attached to, in most cases, iron rims around the top. Uh, they are remarkably thin. They are sometimes sub-millimeter uh, thickness uh, in, in portions. So the, the skill to, to not just um, cast this copper alloy, brass, bronze, depending on uh, what was in the mix, but then to to work it out into the shape that you needed it to be to where it would also be rigid enough to be used as cookware to support all of your soup or whatever you needed to do with it. Um, it it's really a sort of marvel of, of prehistoric uh, metalsmithing. Um, they also come in these two forms. This is a this and the previous example were these uh, globular. They just sort of look like big hanging bowls. Uh, and then you also get uh, my, my preferential projecting belly cauldrons, which are, are these guys, these sort of uh, straight sided, uh, followed by a, a, that, that bowl on the bottom. Um, and, and the sort of, again, the technical skill to create a, a cauldron made out of multiple pieces riveted together that would be watertight, that would support its weight, that would cook effectively, and that were also very much uh, showpieces. They were very much, you know, a, a, a Mercedes Benz of the feast. They're meant to be impressive. They're meant to convey power and potency. Um, the fact that they, they often spend 2000 years in a bog and come out of the ground still looking very impressive is pretty remarkable. And some of these things are, are enormous. The, two, the first two are uh, fairly uh, conservatively sized cauldrons. Some of these get big enough that I could very comfortably curl up and take a nap inside of them. Uh, for some of that evidence of the fact that they were they were more than just cooking pots, uh, we know that we've captured through some very early medieval literature of early Christians who are coming to um, do missionary work in the British Isles. They were encountering uh, pagans who might have be holding on to beliefs that existed from before the Roman period. Uh, and all of them have to do with the sort of potency of cauldrons and the various magical powers they had. Some of them were rather terrible. Um, occasionally, a, an old god would make some uh, unsuspecting sucker uh, stir their cauldron for a year without spilling a drop. And if they did, they would be eaten alive. Um, other cauldrons were gifts to powerful kings uh, that would, uh, if you, you could have the same lamb supper every night and at the end of the night throw your bones of the lamb back in the cauldron and it would emerge in the morning reborn so that you could eat it all over again the next day. This was of course eventually exploited and the, uh, the various Welsh kings began to cook their dead friends who had died in battle to bring them back to life, which uh, ends up poorly as our, our image on the left here is the, the destruction of said um, resurrecting cauldron by, by his enemies. Um, but, but this sort of captures this idea that these are, uh, this is not just a stock pot for making food for you and all of your friends. They are, um, they're very charged objects that are, are used in, in feasts that are more than just everyday um, 
communal eating events. The, these things mean something, uh, and clearly to some degree they mean something religiously, and so these objects are charged with religious power. Uh, this is of course all fine and good until the coming of the Romans. Um, the Romans arrive uh, and we, they have different belief systems, very different material culture overall. And of course they're arriving with the intent to colonize the island. Um, and the Romans themselves had uh, feasting. The, they had the triclinium, that was the room of the house, meant not just for dining, but particularly for um, hospitality duties. The, the family would organize um, dinner parties, which are more accurately described as feasts, to manage relationships with the other prominent families or the people around them, or the community of people they often employed or held as slaves or were looking to create new relationships with. So the Romans entered Britain understanding uh, feasting. They are themselves Iron Age people who, you know, 500 years before were in a very similar boat to where the, the Britons are um, in terms of using very ritually charged objects to have smaller scale feasts. Uh, the thing the Romans also have is bronze cookware. They prefer, um, not necessarily in the home, but the army who are coming into contact with the people of Britain first, uh, also prefer um, to use bronze cookware. It is um, the simplicity, the rusticness of a bronze frying pan was sort of tied to the um, the weary toss of the Roman soldier. The, you know, a good Roman soldier did not have a fancy cook set to bring with him. He had this sort of bare bones frying pan that he made his bread and his dinner with and he was happy with it. Uh, so there's this real utilitarian uh, element to Roman cookware. They're using the same materials uh, and they're, they're familiar with feasting. So they're arriving in, in Britain and we have to ask ourselves, uh, how do these things interact? Um, how did these two peoples with uh, sort of these two similar uh, material cultures and ideas um, come to produce something? Uh, did, did, did one dominate the other? Was one absorbed? Uh, did we get a kind of creolization of the two? Uh, did we lose one in the colonial process? Um, these are the kinds of questions we have to ask archeologically. Um, but they certainly weren't the questions that I was asking when I arrived uh, in England to begin my master's degree. Uh, again, I, as I sort of said, I was, I was a field guy. I was interested in, in sites, in, in field archaeology. As you can tell from these pictures, I'm, I'm very serious uh, about my excavation work. Um, but, but very generally, uh, the things I was interested in were what kind of information do we glean from sites, from landscapes, from features? Uh, and, and perhaps more specifically, I was becoming a, a wall guy. I was very interested in these, um, these the limits of the frontier. Uh, I, I sort of made my pitch going into my master's degree that you know I was going to do a, a degree in frontier studies. I, I was curious about these actual liminal points uh, in the frontier. Pictured left again, a, a grainy author photo of a, a particularly dramatic portion of Hadrian's Wall, and then on the right, the slightly less impressive uh, Antonine Wall, which is rather than a sort of stone uh, castle-like wall, is actually just a series of, of earthen ditches. Um, but this is what I was interested in. This is what I had sort of come to do. Uh, but the more I was in the field, the more I was looking uh, at what questions existed, uh, the more I sort of realized that there are there are questions we couldn't get at through excavation. Uh, and I was interested in this question of what was happening to feasting. Um, how was it changing? How were people interacting with each other through the lens of feasting? Um, and so to do that, I had to sort of change from being a, uh, a field guy to being a laboratory guy. I had to learn new skills, uh, come up with new questions and ways to explore them. Uh, and so I, I came up with a hypothesis for my master's degree that um, if feasting was tied to political power, specifically social power, uh, which was sort of the, the, running, the running idea 
that uh, feasting was used to sort of coerce labor and subjugation from folks. So a, your, your big man uh, would hold a feast to then sort of create a, uh, a dynamic between the people he was hosting of, well, I, get, I can provide this feast for you. You now owe me labor to construct a hill fort, uh, to serve as a defense force, what have you. Um, so if, if feasting was tied to this political power to of local leaders, um, then when the Romans arrive, we should see a decrease in the frequency of feasting because the Romans are the new game in town. They are now politically uh, involved and per Romanization, which we'll talk about in a bit, uh, local leaders should be aiming to become more Roman to be more powerful. They should be leaning away from feasting as a model to secure power and towards becoming more Roman. Uh, so I, I thought, okay, well, what's a way of determining how frequently or the intensity of feasting? And I, I settled on uh, use wear analysis, which is used elsewhere, um, is used uh, as, as a measure of, of sort of the, the object life uh, for artifacts. Um, and I, I thought I could apply that to cauldrons and get an understanding of how often were cauldrons from specific places and times being used before they were deposited. Uh, then I could sort of map out, okay, do we have a decrease in the amount of times a cauldron is used, how much sort of wear and tear it accumulates, and does that decrease with over time uh, under Roman colonization? Um, so I, I, I read a lot of texts on use wear analysis as it was applied to pottery, use wear analysis as it was applied um, to uh, lithic tools, uh, and as it had been applied to bronze axes, uh, but nobody was doing bronze cookware. Uh, so I had to sort of invent uh, a good way to do this, which was more or less taking the very base principles uh, from lithic use wear analysis, uh, understanding sort of the mapping methods for mapping different types of wear from pottery, and then uh, understanding sort of the, the materiality, how does bronze react to use. Uh, and between the two of them, I was able to come up with a pretty comprehensive method to um, uh, analyze, okay, how much are uh, certain uh, cauldrons actually being, I can, uh, unless they are severely damaged, if I can see the original surface, I could come up with a pretty comprehensive understanding of how much use did they incur over their life. And I, I forgot to point out a picture on the right here is a, a magnified uh, surface from the inside of a cauldron showing um, a couple of very small patterned scratches, probably from something like stirring, uh, and then occasionally large non-patterned gashes from, um, you know, somebody knowing which chunk of meat in the soup they wanted and sort of stabbing at it with their, their serving fork to get at it. Um, so I traveled uh, to several museums around the UK. Uh, I, I looked at about 35 cauldrons. I did the use wear analysis. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, I was able to collect actually surprisingly good data. The use for analysis really paid off as a, a way of understanding something about the cauldrons. But then when I went to map the degree of use onto time and place as to test my hypothesis, the result was a lot of nonsense. There was no patterning whatsoever, either between uh, parts of Britain or before or after the Romans. Um, and at that point, uh, and here demonstrating that uh, even today, as I sort of looked for patterns in, uh, on the left here, repair, uh, the, the degree of repair applied before they're deposited on the right, the general size of the cauldron. Um, even though we know that parts of Britain are significantly different, uh, that they are colonized by different times, that they are different ethnic groups or cultures, uh, one is significant, the South is significantly more urban than the North. Nothing seems to matter for patterning. Uh, nothing was statistically significant. Um, but as with science, uh, there's very little we can do about that. 
So you publish, you, you know, you say, here are my results. Here is everything I can say. More so, here's a method for getting at something. Um, and at the very least, isn't it curious that, uh, that something we thought ought to pattern very well doesn't pattern very well. And at the time, I, I thought really it had more to do with my question than anything else. Um, so I, I submitted my master's uh, thesis. I ended up uh, leaving the UK. I returned to uh, Chicago, where I then began working full time in, in CRM, moved around to different CRM. Uh, jobs and was really quite happy to be done with dealing with nonsense questions and, and back in the field, back to digging dirt uh, and seeing what was in the ground, good solid archaeology. Uh, and I remember I, uh, I, I, we were in a swamp uh, somewhere west of Chicago uh, and I, I was digging a shovel test and I was sort of feeling around to see was I was the soil wet or, or am I just down uh, to the water line here and it popped in my head that uh, maybe the, the problem was the theoretical methods that I was, I was applying to it, that uh, the method worked and my hypothesis ought to stand. So maybe it's our understanding of the things around the hypothesis that needed to change. And, and now that I'm sitting here, you know, covered in mud in this swamp, I, I think, well, but also there's other, there's other points I could be measuring. Sure, you swear is, is one uh, way that the, the cauldron accumulates data about its object life, but there's, there's other ways, you know, they, they get repaired. What about the patches? They, they have different designs. What about the choices there? And anyway, I, I didn't do a lot of shovel tests that day because I was, I was distracted. Um, but before I knew it, I found myself sort of uh, drawn back into all right. Well, there's there's more here. I haven't I haven't fully uncovered everything, or I haven't said in it everything that I probably could say about cauldrons. Uh, and before I knew it, I, I was back in the game. Uh, so here is where I'm at now. Here is how uh, sort of my my story in uh, how to address problems, uh, especially with with laboratory archaeology and laboratory methods and the uh, the theories we use to that we have to change often. Uh, to get at the data we want to have. So where, are, where am I now? Uh, looking more broadly at use life, the, the sort of somewhere between method and, and theory often describing uh, the, the means of understanding object use life is uh, was coined by a, a French archaeologist. So it's champ apertois or literally a, a chain of operations. And it's an understanding that when a craftsperson wants to make an object uh, they already know in their head the sequence of steps that they need to undertake to fully create what they want to make. Uh, we call that embodied knowledge. Um, you know, it, it's a pretty poor carpenter who has to go, you know, stop halfway through making his flight of stairs to go look at how does the next stair work. Um, all of that knowledge that they probably got from somebody else who showed them is, is already a part of them when they undertake the process. So if we are very careful in the way that we um, analyze an object, we can kind of work backwards to say, uh, here's the evidence for the steps they took to make the object. What does that say about what they know? Uh, this was started off with lithic debitage. Uh, some very passionate uh, lithics people were reconstructing the debitage piles around lithic tools to fully understand the sequence of steps taken by the flint napper. Uh, they were then comparing these to say, okay, well, we can almost get at schools of flint napping of who is teaching who and how, how the idea of how to go from a chunk of rock to a point is changing. Uh, it, it's really detailed work, but it, it uh, provided very impressive results. So naturally everyone needed to jump on the bandwagon. Uh, and, and people outside of lithics began to adopt it. Uh, but this becomes kind of uh, problematic when something like lithics is a single material. So everybody who's working on the lithic tool understands something about lithics. When I'm looking at cauldrons and I want to work backwards, I run into a problem. The last person to, well, the last person to touch the cauldron in its process of making wasn't even one person, it was two people, because we know archaeologically that blacksmiths who would have worked the iron for the handle or for the, the rim or handle and uh, coppersmiths 
aren't the same person. They're two different people who have two different knowledge sets. They work in two different parts of the site. Um, and never the twain shall meet unless they seem to be working on a cauldron. Uh, so that's a problem. Moreover, the, the smith uh, doesn't know anything about getting uh, the fuel for his forge. Uh, he doesn't necessarily know how to go mine for the raw material and the people who are smelting the raw material into the raw material for him to use also have their own set of knowledge. So to get to a cauldron, I have to work through uh, sets of individual craftsmen who are working together in a network. So I've proposed that rather than a chain, sort of implying a, a very simple uh, and straightforward linkage of operations between a single individual, uh, an operational network. So a, a sequence of operations undertaken by a network of people. And that's a little out there, but to, to give an example uh, of what I mean by this and how we get social things out of that, we can talk about something um, pretty modern. Uh, so here on the right, if anyone here is a, a fan of antique bottles, this is a pretty classic example of, a, of amethyst glass. Uh, while glass producers in the early 20th century and 19th century could intentionally choose to make purple uh, bottles, more often than not, when we find purple bottles in the present, it's because they've been solarized. Uh, in the 19th century and early 20th century, glassmakers would use, uh, would add manganese into their glass to decolorize it. It was a way of producing colorless glass, which was seen as a little more fancy than just colored glass, which often the color is derived from impurities in the raw material. So if you're getting colorless glass, it's, it's that little something extra. Um, there was a problem though that the there was no manganese producers in the United States. So all glass bottling factories were importing their manganese from manganese producing chemical experts in Germany, which is why we have a very hard break in uh, manganese decolored glass in 1939. All of a sudden in the historical record, we cease to get, uh, we cease to get amethyst glass. Uh, now we have the history behind that to understand why we have the archeological phenomenon. But if you work backwards, looking at the different parts of the object that are originating from outside the original craft person, the, the bottle glass maker, uh, we understand that there's a social relationship there uh, and we can measure the fact that that social relationship ceases to exist in 1939. So if this is prehistory, we don't necessarily know the cause, but we're still measuring social relationships from an object. And that's more than we had before. Uh, so then I went about the very uh, sort of tedious task of breaking down the various parts of the cauldron that could be analyzed uh, by different methods, uh, what that data would look like, how I would compare it. Um, it's tedious. Uh, and then we can start to group uh, the different stages together by person or location uh, so that we know when a, a feature of a cauldron passes from one to the other, that represents a relationship. If there is an increase in that feature uh, or if there is a decrease in that feature over time or over space, we can begin to measure those social relationships uh, in ways that archaeologically otherwise are non-existent. Um, uh, a brief example, I've sort of run the numbers before on the iron rim around cauldrons. Uh, there seems to be a pretty um, small location around South Central England where uh, cauldrons make it into the ground and make it back out again with intact iron suspension rings. Now that probably, well, statistically it's beyond the level of significance where it is just accident. More likely uh, it has to do with the individuals who are responsible for repair to that iron rim or can replace the iron rim and their availability to do so. It's entirely possible that if you live up in Northern Scotland and your iron rim breaks, you don't have the guy to fix it. So your cauldron is effectively dead. Um, that's 
speculative, but more importantly, I just want to demonstrate that we can measure certain data of this way and, and sort of understand relationships between people in place. Uh, so then I needed a new way to approach how I was thinking about Roman Britain overall. I mentioned before this idea of Romanization uh, was the uh, so the go-to way of understanding how Rome interacted with provincial people uh, was the, 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 me the method and purpose of their colonization. The idea was to make other people Roman. Rome invaded Europe uh, to make the people of Europe like themselves. Uh, that was their uh, colonial project and everybody else either got on board or they didn't. So the things people were measuring were this degree of Romanness uh, and this idea that being Roman was a thing that you sort of negotiated. Uh, you either got on board because you wanted to get in good with the Romans or you had something to prove, so you resisted it. And this idea of acceptance versus resistance uh, was uh, for a long time the predominant way of understanding Roman archaeology of Britain, uh, and certainly under, uh, was influential to some degree with how I was approaching cauldrons when I first began looking at them in my master's degree, um, because fundamentally I, I was taking it for granted that uh, when the Romans were arriving, anyone who wanted to be powerful locally would be acting Roman and thus moving away from the use of cauldrons. Um, what then? Can I replace that with, uh, well, I need something that's a little bit more accommodating because if we're looking at Romanization, the thing it, uh, it, it is, is fine with explaining is the military presence um, uh, in the North and West in the loosest sense. It can say, okay, the people to the Southeast uh, adopted Romanism, uh, be they became Roman, the people to the west and to the north didn't, they resisted, and so there was, uh, they had to use military force to either force Roman, becoming Roman by violence, or they were just holding on to territory to, for people who didn't want to become Roman. Um, this, the, where this fails is actually in then not the landscape archaeology of where are where is the military presence, but the material culture itself. Um, because if we're looking at again, if I look at my own data for feasting, uh, it isn't patterned that the people in the south are accepting of becoming a roaming and stop feasting, and in the north they aren't resisting by doing uh, either more or feasting, or they become sort of colonial subjects and stop doing it altogether. Ag again, the the patterning is. Um, is more varied than that. And, and Romanization just isn't flexible enough of an idea to accommodate that. Um, so in looking for alternatives, I actually landed very local to myself and I, I, I sort of landed in the way people look at colonialism in the Great Lakes region during the uh, sort of early and mid 17th century. Uh, the the French arrived in the Great Lakes, uh, sort of with the same colonial ambitions that their nemeses, the British, were uh, exploiting and benefiting from on the East Coast. Um, in, you know, they were very particularly interested in in furs and other hard goods, uh, but you know, they were still looking to colonize the Piedin Haute, the the high country that was the Great Lakes. Um, but unlike the the English who were particularly successful on the east coast the French really struggled in their colonial various colonial projects uh, not in everything they did they certainly got the beaver pelts they were after um, but in terms of uh, establishing more military forts uh, in terms of establishing um, permanent ally ships uh, dismantling local power structures, they, they struggled. Uh, and the way to understand this is through uh, what's called middle ground theory, even though it's less of a theory and more of a lens. Uh, and it, it, it understands that in colonial spaces, everyone involved brings with them their own, uh, we'll call them wants. 
Uh, and what it is, is a the, we, we start with the assumption that neither side is fully able to enforce their wants. And so what you begin to look for are the elements from each side that undermine the wants of the other side. Uh, within French colonial archaeology, we understand that uh, the various Algonquin people, but in particular the Anishinaabek tribes, um, had very complicated kinship systems that also very much decentralized the power in the region. Where the English had arrived on the East Coast and had immediately begun dealing with um, more powerful centralized or more centralized power in strong chiefs where they could strike deals with or at least understood the sort of boundaries of uh, which people were whom uh, the French were running into the issue of there were not clear boundaries over who was who and where they lived and who was in charge uh, in particular when they wanted to coerce a deal out of someone, they found that the, the primary issue was there was a guy who seemed like a chief, but when they approached him and said, hey, can you, you know, if we make a deal with you, can you make your people do it? His answer was more often than not, I can agree to something, but the best I can give you is a convincing argument to make everybody else do it. I can't make anybody else do anything. Uh, this level of decentralized power negotiated traditionally through kinship was an obstacle for the uh, the political ambitions, the colonial project that the French had. Um, oh, here's my the slide I was supposed to talk about all that on. Again, on the, on the left, we have the Ottawa, a particular thorn in the French ambition. Uh, and on the right, the, the primary fort through which all of the, the various drama unfolded uh, at Michilimackinac. Um, and I, I, I was already previously involved with um, the proto-historical and early historical colonial archaeology around the Great Lakes. So this is all material I was somewhat familiar with, but um, uh, approaching it through a theoretical lens, all of a sudden sort of uh, awakened to this idea that uh, it might be possible to apply this to this new social data that I was gathering from Britain, that I could approach Britain as a middle ground where rather than the only measure by which people were acting was against being Roman or not being Roman, we have various Romans who have their wants and we have various local people who have their wants. Um, looking to the, to the degree to which each is enforcing them and trying to understand which elements might be at play that either enable or undermine each other. Uh, and this proves particularly effective in very rural areas where we don't have a lot of settlement data, particularly in the north, again, in that border region, uh, especially right on the frontier, because uh, in very recent years, the understanding of Hadrian's Wall has really shifted from a, a hard line at the edge of the Roman Empire uh, to more of, well, something less certain in its purpose. Um, because one would expect a military fortification uh, to keep people out to have all of its defenses pointed in the same direction. The truth of the matter is Hadrian's Wall has not just defensive areas pointing in both directions, but also has just open gates for people to move through. Um, more likely, Hadrian's Wall is serving as some sort of uh, regulatory measure for people in the area. Uh, probably more, more than likely, they're trying to regulate the Brigantes. Uh, here's a map of a very rough speculative sketch of the various peoples of Iron Age Britain. Uh, and you'll notice the large section in the middle belongs to the Brigantes, who are sort of described as not, a, not an ethnic group, not a, a tribe or race, but just very generally as a, a sort of loose confederacy of, of individuals. Um, which is confusing enough in the literature, uh, but archaeologically too, they, they all seem to be very similar. So why archaeologically can we sort of parse them as being similar, but the Romans are convinced that, you know, this isn't uh, like the people we've been dealing with in the South who we, you know, they have a king, he lives on a hill, we give him a bunch of gold and he becomes our client king. Um, a good way of approaching this might be to say, okay, well, we understood that the 
uh, in, in the Great Lakes, the colonial project was undermined by decentralized power. If we really lean into understanding the Brigantes as similarly being uh, composed of uh, uh, peoples who have very decentralized power, likely relying on some sort of some form of kinship, um, we can begin to sort of understand possible uh, social relationships that now I can also back up with the data I'm planning on getting from my feasting equipment. Uh, what does craft work and feasting equipment uh, tell us about social relationships that do and do not exist around the island? And how does that correlate with this idea that uh, where Rome is expending most of its military energy has less to do with the fact that the people there aren't accepting being Roman, but rather the people there are undermining the colonial project. So we'll find out when I get a chance to actually go and collect that data. In the meantime, I appreciate all of you sort of listening through my, my prattling about theory development and method development. Uh, this has been a lot of, um, it, it's been fairly experimental as I, I try to do new things with very old material. Uh, and as a, again, as a, as a field archeologist who really likes dirt, uh, I have a little bit of anxiety about being in the lab. And so it's, it's always good to, to sort of run through uh, these ideas and, and make sure they make sense with other very smart people. And more importantly, I just appreciate uh, you welcoming me to the break talks and uh, giving me your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it.